taught in school that we have two broad classes of animals. We're told that we have wild animals and we have domestic animals. We're told that wild animals stay in the bush and domestic animals live among men. Now, domestic animals can be categorized into two. We have those that are pets and we have those that are for consumption. Now, those that are pets are either bought deliberately or given as gifts, while those that are for consumption end up in the pot. Examples of pets. We have dogs, we have cats, depending on where you are from. Examples of those for consumption. Examples of those for consumption. Uh, we have chicken, we have fish and so on and so forth. Now, these two broad categories of animals have their specific food. We have chicken feed, we have goat food, we have cat food, and so on and so forth. But there is one animal. This animal looks like a domestic animal, but it has every attribute of a wild animal. Dead or alive, it is a terrorist. It does not have a specific food. It can eat anything. That is why it behaves anyhow. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking about a rat since morning. First of all, I'd like you to introduce yourself to us the way you are most comfortable with. Damola is my name. Um, Damola Digo is my name. I'm Master of Ceremony Stand of Comedian. Um, an academic researcher. I love making people happy. I love solving people's problems. I have a little initiative called the Adigo Damola Initiative where I try to inspire young people to be better versions of themselves. I've been at it for a number of years. So basically, everything about me is centered around talking and making people happy, basically. That is that is who I am in a nutshell. Wow, thank you, thank you. Um, you are also a lecturer, right? Well, I used to lecture, but I stopped. I, used, I lectured for six years. Before I started lecturing, I was anchoring the events and doing all this. But then, I just felt I, I just felt they deserved so much more and then I was not giving them that value, you know. So I decided to opt out of the university so that maybe someone else that would, that would do it better, you know, would get the job while I still pursue my PhD and go back to the classroom much later when I feel the time was right for me to do that. So you're full time into comedy now, full time? Yes, that, that's all I do now, anchoring events corporate events, doing stand-up comedy. How, how did you get into this? How? Oh, okay. Did I, well, will I say I planned it? No, it wasn't planned. It was just orchestrated maybe by God. You know, um, when I graduated from the university, like any other graduate, all that was on my mind was okay. Um, I had a first class from the university. So Which I, class? I had political science. First class, great. Yes, yes. So I had I, I had an idea or I had the thought because that was the practice then that if you graduated with the first class the university will absorb you. So I had it in mind that this university will absorb me. So I I decided um, you know, I just kept my mind open that very soon they will call me for a job. But before then, you know, I met I met Sako. He told me to work with him. Even though before I met Sako, before graduation, I've always anchored events in school, you know, all campuses will invite me to come and do their departmental dinner and university programs and all. I was just having, I was, there was really no structure. All I was just doing was enjoy myself, cracking jokes, entertaining people. And if you paid me or not, I was not, not really interested. All I was just interested in then was just to keep it going to think. But then, as I graduated, I now got to understand the fact that, okay, this can be a, an actual business. This can be um, a job that, you know, you can do. So, I started doing it. I started following Sako here and there, learning the principles and practices, and also the business side of um, my job. And, you know, as I was doing it, you know, professionally by 2012, then the lecturing thing came around 2015 and so i picked up that one and i was doing both of them simultaneously and then later on i just decided that okay let me drop the lecturing thing for now and focus on and focus on my events but basically i've always had it in me i've always anchored events right from when i was in the university but at graduation meeting circle it helped me to put some structure to it and that is where that is why we are where we are today wow okay Thank you. So th there wasn't any hint from your secondary school days that, oh, maybe yeah, yeah. 
They were. Maybe what? Maybe this guy is funny, or this guy will be an actor or a comedian. That's always yeah. the, yeah. the path. Yes, I, I, I used to hear that a lot when I was in secondary school. I must let you also know that while I was in secondary school, I, the first time I ever handed the microphone in my, in my life, I think a lot of people was in secondary school, 2004. You know, <laughs> I remember I was in the dining hall and then I had this little something like that, you know, people were there and I was cracking jokes. And then I was in the drama group. I used to take comical roles in the drama group of the school. Then I joined the one in the church. And then I was always doing, you know, comical roles and people used to tell me that Mola you're funny, that Mola you're this, and like that. And so, you know, I had it at the back of my mind. Like, okay, it wasn't really a job that time that was very popular, you know. And so I I could not really figure it out, even though I knew that it was possible, I could not really figure it out. But then when I graduated from the university, I started anchoring the next year and there. It started making a bit of more sense to me. But when I now graduated officially, you know, aha. And I met a mentor that could put me through. I understood it better and I knew that yes, if if some structure is put into it, structure in the sense of the way I handle it, the way I do my job, the way I negotiate, the way I package myself, then it can be a business that is quite positive. So but from secondary school, you know, people have been mentioning it and I used to hear them and you know, I just took it as people are just talking and seeing whatever I was doing but you know I never said from secondary school I want to be a stand-up comedian okay. I never said that but now that's what I do <laughs> yeah. all right so you you study political science for your first degree right yes yes what inspired that course from the start you wanted to be a lawyer or something what inspired political science I actually wanted to study either of economics or accounting but then, I tried jam the first time. It did not work. After my first jam, I got maybe 210 or something, and I wanted to study economics or accounting. You know, first choice about family, I don't know the Second choice, I think the same school. Then, I did not get to the admission. And then I had to ask myself very logical questions. To study accounting, to study economics, you must be mathematically proficient. And I discovered that my lowest score in that jam at that time was mathematics. My wife, I had a C6 in mathematics. Everywhere that I studied anything, my lowest grades were math was mathematics. And I decided that what will I study that will remove mathematics from the picture and that will give me a small child all the way. I discovered that to study political science, I did not need mathematics. All I needed was government, economics, and any other subject that is from either of the social sciences or arts. Okay. And so I had to look at those subjects and I discovered that CRS is one that I feel I'm a Christian, even though reading your Bible does not mean you pass CRS. There's a technique attached to passing CRS. Yes. So for one year, I critically studied it. And when my jam results came out, I passed very well and I gained admission to study political science. Uh, but but uh, there, there was a little twist at the, in the old journey. I wanted to go to Obafemi Awolowo University. Uh, but for one reason or the other, you know, somebody just called my dad. I passed the jam so well and I got to 65 that time. And the cutoff was about 250 something. So I was so confident that I was going to gain admission. But, before the, the list came out, a professor, you know, called my dad and told him that he was on the future list. My father believed that we, he started looking for alternatives. And so he saw a show state university somewhere and said, Damola, get ready, go and fill this form. You may go to a show state university. I felt so bad about it that dad, why? I want to go to Ife. He said, your name is not on the admission list. What do we do? And I don't want you to be at home for another year. Mm -hmm. So I opted for a few state university. I went to fill the form. You know, I filled it with local. Because it was a new school. Um, all my mind was in Ife. And uh, my friends that we all chose Ife together were already getting ready for the admission list. I was called for an interview. Okay. Right. I passed the interview and I was given admission immediately. 
in Osho State University. Okay. Two weeks into the admission, my friend called me for me that my name was on, on was on the merit list. So immediately I called my dad, Daddy, my name is on the merit list. Ife. And my father made a statement, said Dabola, remain where you are. Wow. I felt very bad because I really worked hard to go to Ife. And I really wanted to be there. I imagine, you know, imagining yourself in a particular university before admission came. And I obeyed him. I stayed where I was. And the issue is that throughout my journey in Osho State University, I was on scholarship throughout. Wow. By the university. Excellent. Because I was on a first class all the way. And if you're on a first class all the way, you are exempted from paying school fees. And um, throughout my journey there, I discovered myself. I got a job, at least my first public sector engagement in my life was in that same university. I, you know. That's, that's interesting. Okay, can you tell us one of your most funny childhood experience? One of my funniest childhood experiences is ah, my mom, you know, the way she brought us up very strict teacher, you know. I remember as a child, my mother used to communicate with her eyes. If we were running up and down, and my mother looked at me in a particular way, I would get the message. You know, if she blinked her eyes twice, we understood what she meant. If she blinked three times, we understood what she meant. If she should blink four times, meaning we should meet at home. So it was a general practice and principle that, you know, shaped our upbringing, you know. Uh, we used to go for parties then, and then she would monitor us. She would tell me how you, you'd be beaten when you get home. You say you're embarrassing the entire family. I think as if you know it out of your house, you know. So all those kinds of experiences, you know, were, were quite funny for us. No, we're, we're, we're not funny then, but are quite funny now, you know. Thank you for that. Okay, three values of virtues that you admire most in people. I like people that have character, you know, that have a strong sense of character. People that respect people, that don't look down on people. I like those that are, that have a drive to achieve whatever they want to achieve. You know, that's number two. Those that say, I want to be this, and they pursue it and they achieve it. I like people like that. Then I also like people that, that are deliberate about how they impact the lives of others. Now, let me explain better. Somebody that will not want to throw trash on the floor, right? Because it feels that trash plus 500 other people's trash is, will block the drainage. So, because of, because of that, it will exclude the zone by waiting to exceed the trash can so that it does not add to the problem of the society. I like such people. Somebody that, that is deliberate about the way he lives. Someone who is purposeful and intentional about the way they live. Yeah. Somebody that is very intentional. Yeah, I like, I like such people. Wow. That I will not want to do this because I feel somebody else should be hurt by this. Or I feel somebody will think what I'm doing is correct. Or I feel, you know, somebody that is purposeful and deliberate about everything that they do. Wow. Yeah. I like powerful. people like that. That's, that's, that's powerful. Okay, let's, let's go this way. One food that you can eat over and over again. Gari. <laughs> Pure gari. I like, I like that. Without. Yes. Uh, with or without anything. Wow. With or without anything. I like it. I think it was born out of my secondary school behaviors. You know. Did you I stay in the body house? In the secondary yes, school? Yes, I did. Oh, yes, okay. okay. I lived in a body house. But I think I like gari. I like it a lot. Okay. What would be your top three motivations in life? I pursue whatever I want and I try to catch it. It may take time, but when I say it, I'll do it. That's one thing that motivates me about myself. Another major motivation I have is the fact that I believe so much in God and I believe God can do it. So, in any situation I find myself, no matter how it is, I believe that if I should tell God about it, He will sort it out for me. And there are so many situations I found myself that. Let me give a funny example. Okay. If I'm an anchoring an event, and 
and calling them the MC of the party. And people are taking too long on the dance floor. And chasing them away can be difficult. Maybe that's all right. I can pray to God that God send them back to their city. Maybe. Wow. God, please, just send them back. And by themselves, some of them just are going one by one in front of me. Okay. I've seen it happen a lot of times. So you can imagine that kind of situation where I just see God and say, these people have been here for so long. Wow. And then of them, after like some minutes, they just in the heat of the earth. So I believe so much in God. So that motivates me a lot that I have somebody I can call that is powerful than any other person. And he help me solve any problem I find. I believe I have that confidence. That is a very strong motivation for me. And that motivation that I have is that I have some good people around me. Wow, I love you. Know, I can talk to you. That will not judge me. That will not make me feel uncomfortable about what I have said. And I will still ensure that whatever I bring to them is solved, you know. That is a very great one that I don't take for granted. I have some very wonderful people around. Yeah. Wow, that, that's really great. I, I, I love that. So the next question is uh, your happiest career moment. Uh, for me, my happiest career moment is anytime I have the opportunity to make people happy. Anytime I see genuine laughter or genuine happiness, basically genuine happiness from people. You know, I feel very motivated and inspired because um, what really gives me joy is the fact that um, I, I love making people happy. So when I achieve that by virtue of what I do, I'm always excited from irrespective of who it comes from, from the highest to the lowest to anybody, anybody that is happy by virtue of what I do. You know, I'm always very excited. So those are my high moments. Anytime I see the real happiness from people, I'm always very happy with people. Top three decisions you think you've taken in your life? Best three decisions right. you've taken? Best three decisions. Um, number one, knowing, having a relationship with God. Number two, um, obeying my father, as touching the choice of the university to attend. Number three, meeting my mentor, Saku. And um, I will add one, very important, meeting my wife. You know, wow. Those are if not in your current career, what mm -hmm. career would it have been? What profession would you have been in? I'll be lecturing in a university. If I'm not doing what I do at the moment, I'll be a lecturer in a university. Okay. Okay. Five take away on a get away. What I mean by that is five things you would take with you if you are going to be away for a period of time and you can take more than five things, five items, what would those be? Well, I'll take my phone, take my charger, I'll take an extension box, I'll take uh, my brush, I'll take my toothpaste. And if I can add one thing, I'll take my deodorant. So I'm very confident. And can you briefly tell us why each of those items? My phone is very important to me. It's from that phone I connect to the world, you know. With that phone, I know what is happening. It's with the phone, I know what is happening everywhere. Is with the phone that I make interactions, I talk to people, and I, I I make contact with people. And so it is very important to me. That's why. Number two, my my charger has to be with me so that the phone is continuously powered. Mm -hmm. And I want everything to be perfect. Somebody will say, Why won't I take a power bank? Yeah, I'll take it. I would have taken a power bank, but the power bank will run out to then charge So I still need the charger. Right. Then I need to brush my teeth. Because I know I will have cause to speak with people and I need my confidence. And also my deodorant. So that um, I'm just, if everything is built around those, the last three will boost my confidence. The last, the first three will aid my communication with, every, with the larger society. So, last question Top three counsels to younger people? Number one, take life easy. Don't be under pressure. The world has changed. I mean that now the whole world is at your fingertips. You see what people are achieving at very tender ages and you can be under pressure. And the pressure can be very genuine. It is that person's time. So let that person shine in his own time. Your own time is coming. So just take it easy. Don't put yourself under pressure. Number two, don't run after sudden wealth at the moment. 
a lot of young people make a lot of money but they don't have the capacity to manage those resources they have not learned financial management that's why they mismanage funds that they stumble on go through the process of understanding how to manage resources manage people manage whatever that you find around you so that when your money comes you are, you are a total package you are fully equipped with every knowledge you have to manage your resources effectively and i think finally try to develop yourself develop yourself school is not a scam acquire knowledge acquire an education be be proficient you know academically what you learn in school may not directly apply to real life situations right but what school does to you that it shapes your mind right to be able to um face any situation that you find yourself that you find yourself in so that you are not confused you are not in you are not in a, in a state of uh, problems you know what school does for you is that it helps to shape your mind that even if you are selling water you are selling it in a very unique way if you are even if you work in the informal sector you are doing it in a formal way you understand people will see the difference I know a lot of learned people that are photographers today, right? Very learned. Before, if you're a photographer, you're seen as a dropout. So you're seen as somebody that does not know what to do. But now, photographers are big men, you know. And I know a number of them that graduated from school normally, even have master's degrees, but decided to do photography. And they do it in a very different and unique way. You understand? So what school will do for you is that will help you shape your mind to be a better person. So don't despise school. Um, develop yourself, don't be under pressure, and then um, you know, wow, add value to yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.